All right, we're going to receive God's word this morning. I'm really excited about this, that every time we gather, um, God speaks a word to us. God doesn't just gather us for no purpose. You know, somebody said to me years ago that God is not like a politician. A politician will see a group of people and then suddenly find something to say. But God has something to say, so he brings people, all right? So God has brought us because he has something that he wants to say to us. And it's a real significant time for us as a church. Um, because like I said, this makes it eight years since Sycamore Church was planted um, this month. And it's a time of reflection for us. It's a lot of looking back, reflecting, like we sang about the goodness of God. But it's also a lot of looking forward and just seeing what God has ahead of us. Challenging ourselves into the seasons of the so much more. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen God's best yet. Um, and, and God has so much more to come. That's what we believe. So we're positioning ourselves. And... At the start of the year, as we were just planning the seasons and planning the year, I specifically felt just that burden at this time to have some people speak into our church. And, um, you know, Pastor Chris, who is going to be speaking to us this morning, is somebody that I, I, I think is a great leader, is somebody that has served faithfully for many years, not just leading his family, but leading the church. He serves as lead pastor at Waterloo Pentecostal Assembly in Ontario, Canada. And um, such a great work, beautiful church, and such a great work that he does there leading. And um, I specifically just really wanted him to speak into our church at this time. I tried to get him to speak before, but um, hadn't been able to. But I'm just so grateful, and we as a church are so grateful, Pastor Chris, that you would be so generous um, to just open out your heart and speak to us and, you know, stay late hours in the night to um, be with us in service this morning and speak a word that would bless us this morning all right and so church as always with open hearts and just expectation of what God will do um, let's give a good welcome to pastor Chris Padier lead pastor of Water Lupens Coastal Assembly he brings us God's word greetings to all of you at Sycamore Community Church today I am so honored to be with you on this historical milestone, the celebration of your eighth anniversary as a church. To God be the glory for the great things he has done in and through you there. I want to thank Pastor Tolalupe for inviting me to share God's word with you. I connected with your pastor through his brother, Toby, and he previously served at our church as an elder here in Canada, in Waterloo. And I was asked by your pastor to write an endorsement for his third book, Dust Breath Conversations, Tracking Origins, Charting Becomings. Your pastor is a brilliant communicator. You just need to know how blessed you are to have a pastor who is an awesome preacher, an awesome teacher, an awesome writer. And would you just take a moment with me today just to honor your pastor, even just with a hand of applause today, him and his family, thanking God for his leadership. We honor you, pastor and family. So Pastor Tolalupe has asked me to bring you a message today on the exemplary and global possibilities of our sound as believers as a church, understanding that your theme for the year 2022 is audacity. And so I believe that God is forming you and shaping you to be audacious people, people who will take risks for the kingdom of God, people who will be bold, empowered by the Spirit of God. Our scripture comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. So the tradition we have at our church, we just believe that it's so important to reverence God as we read. And often we read together in one voice. But let me read the scripture to you today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. And the scripture says, For we know, brothers and sisters, that's us, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. 
The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Father, I pray that today as we meditate on your word, that you would teach us. Holy Spirit, come, illuminate the text for us. Inspire us to live audaciously in this world. May we be your representatives. May we be your ambassadors in the earth, oh God. And so, Father, I pray for Sycamore Community Church today that this would be true of them, that they would do mighty, great exploits for you in this world, oh God. Thank you for your presence with them this morning. And I pray, God, that you would empower them to live this audacious life. Empower me, God, for the preaching of your word. I ask for your anointing. I ask for your strength. I ask for clarity and for understanding for my friends today that we would hear the word, not only be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, having understood it and applied it rightly. And so we thank you together in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. You may be seated. When people hear your name, what do they say about you? In other words, what is your reputation? Is it a positive reputation or is it a negative reputation? Do people know that you're a Christian or do people not know you as a Christian? When people hear the word or the name Sycamore Community Church, what do people say about you collectively? In other words, what is not your personal reputation? What is your collective reputation? Do you have street credibility? What do other believers from other churches have to say about you? What do unbelievers say about you? What do your neighbors say about you? Well, friends, you should be concerned about this because you are part of this church, Sycamore Community Church. This matters. Your reputation collectively and individually matters. In Proverbs 22, verse 1, King Solomon, the wisest man, has said, A good name is more desirable than riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. See, the deacon qualification in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 states, these leaders were to be people who were well-respected. The elder qualifications that we find in Scripture in 1 Timothy 3, verse 7 states that these leaders were to have a good reputation with outsiders. And so a poor reputation brings disrepute to the name of God, but a good reputation, it brings honor and glory to the Lord. And so this morning, I want to share with you three observations that are drawn from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 to 10, about the reputation of the church in Thessalonica in regards to who they actually became with the hope of challenging you to carefully consider who you are becoming. First point this morning is you became imitators. You became imitators. We find this in verse 6, where the Apostle Paul says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. You see, we do not get to choose the conditions of when we receive the gospel. God can meet us in the highest moments of our life, but God can also, and often, and he tends to meet us in the lowest moments of our lives. And the Thessalonian believers were living in the midst of severe suffering. And their choice to follow Jesus was not well received by others in the city, by others around them, by the people that they knew. In particular, the Jews in Thessalonica were particularly hostile to the Christians, the new converts, because they were jealous of them. They rounded up some of the local thugs 
and they formed a mob mentality. They started a riot in Thessalonica. And in Acts 17, verses 6 to 7, we learn that they threw the city into great turmoil by saying, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. See, Christianity was more of a threat to the Jews than secularism and imperialism of Rome. They welcomed the emperor, but they rejected Jesus. And shortly after escaping from Thessalonica, the apostle Paul and Silas, they traveled to the Berean Jews. When compared, Paul described the Berean Jews as being more noble in character than the Thessalonian Jews. In Acts 17, verse 13, we read how the Thessalonian Jews created trouble even in the neighboring town of Berea. And the scripture says, but when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. There are some people who are diametrically opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will make it difficult for others to come to faith in him. They will even travel from place to place to hinder someone from preaching. This is the opposition that comes against audacious people. But perhaps you came to Christ in a season much like the Thessalonian believers. Maybe you were excommunicated from your family. Maybe you were rejected by your friends. Maybe your home city or country were hostile to Christianity at large. I want you to know that God has given you many new brothers and new sisters. He has given you spiritual fathers and mothers. And before you chose God, God had already chosen you. Isn't that good news, my friends? And while the gospel of Jesus Christ was rejected by some, it was welcomed by others, including most of you who are hearing me today. Thank the Lord. And so in becoming Christians, the Thessalonian believers were imitating the apostle Paul. They were imitating Timothy and Silas and many others. And so we must look back to see the way in which they had received the gospel from these men. In verse 5, we read about several traits that the Apostle Paul and his companions embodied in their witness of the gospel. These are traits that went beyond mere words, and they were actual demonstrations of power. Now, do not be mistaken today. Words do matter because words, they actually communicate truth. But he was worthy of imitation, the Apostle Paul, because he was not like other Jewish teachers or Greek philosophers whose message was only heard. His message was actually to be experienced. This power, where did it come from? This power was rooted in the Holy Spirit. It resulted from deep convictions. And so it is the same Holy Spirit that was at work in Paul's proclamation. And it's the same Holy Spirit who was at work in the Thessalonians as they were regenerated, as they became born again. So let me be clear that in using the word imitation, we are not referring to a fake version, something you buy that is a fake imitation. We are to imitate people who are true, authentic Real believers. We need to be like the Apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas who spoke and acted in the power of the Spirit. They operated out of those deep convictions of who God is and what God has done for them. And so I want to ask you a question today. Whom have you been imitating? Ponder that for a moment. Whom have you been imitating? Surely the ultimate answer, the, the Sunday school answer is Jesus Christ. However, let's not forget the spiritual leaders in our lives, the mentors in our lives that we imitate. And if you are imitating them, then we should see the traits you imitate appear in you as well. Godly traits. 
do people see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you? Do people hear that you're a person of deep convictions, of deep gospel convictions? The Apostle Paul's communication with the Thessalonian believers was similar to his communication with the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 2, 3 to 5, where he says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My, word, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. May that be true of you, my friends. Whom have you been imitating? Secondly, you became a model. You, my friends, are becoming a model today. We find this in verse 7. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. See, we cannot just say, stay as imitators. We must become worthy of imitation. And if we are individually worthy of imitation, then we are collectively worthy of being modeled. Collectively, the church of Thessalonica became a model for all the other believers of the early churches. And I truly believe today the Sycamore Community Church is called to be a model church for other churches. Amen? I hope you believe that today. You are called to be a model church. I love maps. I love traveling. So let me help you gain some bearings of the biblical geography that is embedded in this text. See, those who receive the gospel must also live out the gospel. And so Macedonia was a Roman province. Thessalonica, also known as Thessaloniki, eventually became the capital of that province. Achaia was the southernmost part of mainland Greece on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Biblical Macedonia is now known as modern-day Greece, extending into the southern regions of Albania and North Macedonia. And so with this geography in mind, to whom would these believers serve as a model? According to Acts 17, verse 1, the Apostle Paul had to travel through Amphipolis and Apollonia to get to Thessalonica. He had to travel through some small towns and bigger cities and areas to get to this final location of Thessalonica. And according to Acts 20, verse 4, the Apostle Paul was joined by others along his missionary journey. The scripture says that several men were traveling with him. They were Sopater, son of Phyrus, from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy and Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. But since half of these people mentioned are from Macedonia and the others half from Asia, we understand that the Apostle Paul was first and foremost talking about having a provincial influence having influence in the province where you are, in the location where God has specifically and strategically placed you. The Thessalonians would be a model to the believers and the small churches in Berea and Amphipolis and Apollonia and maybe as far as Philippi. Achaia, however, was a small neighboring province, meaning that the Apostle Paul was also talking about interprovincial influence, interstate influence. The Thessalonians would be a model to the believers and the churches in Sancre and Corinth. And so if God wanted us to have both regional and provincial influence, that you need to be a model for other churches, friends at Sycamore, not only in Oyo State, but in Kwara State and Osun State and Ogun State, in the neighboring states around your state, you need to be influential. You need to be audacious and be a model. A model for our churches in southwestern and south southern and north central Nigeria. May God give you that influence. The Thessalonians needed to come to terms with the local influence 
they had as the church. And by model, God was not talking about replicating a particular style of church in another geographical context. We see that happening where there's many multi-site churches and we just take that DNA from one place and we put it in another place. We put it in another place. There's nothing wrong about that. It's a popular trend right now. But instead, God was talking about the characteristics that make for a healthy church. What does it look like to be a Christ-centered church? What does it look like to be a gospel-saturated church? What does it look like to be a scripture-guided church? What does it look like to be a spirit-empowered church? See, God does not necessarily want more churches. I think sometimes we think that's the answer. God does not necessarily want more churches. God simply wants healthy churches. Amen? A healthy church will come alongside other churches in order to help them become more healthy. I want you to ask yourself this question. What or who are you modeling? What are you modeling today? What are you modeling to the world? People are watching you carefully in order to know if you are who you say you are and if you do what you say you will do. Thirdly, today, the desire and the prayer is that you became known everywhere, that your church will become known everywhere as the church in Thessalonica was. Verse 8 says, the Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. There is a musical effect called reverb. Reverb is a reflection of sound that is made. It's different from an echo, which is about a movement of sound which returns back to its source. But reverb, however, is more about the space in which a sound is made. Now, some of you have been in an acoustically engineered setting, like a a well-designed church or maybe a theater. And if you clap your hands once, the sound reverberates for one or more seconds. When it comes to our ability then to transmit the Lord's message, the world is our studio. Christians are to release a sound throughout the earth because Christianity is meant to be a global movement. And in doing so, we make God, not our church, famous throughout the earth. That's the goal, to make God famous, not for us to become famous, but to make God famous throughout the whole earth. You do this not only by giving to missions, but by being on mission. Your sound reverberates from Ibadan to Oyo State to Nigeria, throughout Africa, and all around the world. Who knows who will be impacted? Even as messages are aired on the internet and shared on your website or your Facebook page or on uh, YouTube, who knows the multiplication, who knows the exponential impact of what God can do? The Apostle Paul, he told the Thessalonians that their faith is known everywhere. Where is everywhere? Everywhere is somewhere, but it also can be anywhere. It means there's no boundaries. It means that there's no limits. It has the possibility of reaching the least reached people groups. It goes where you cannot physically go, and it can accomplish what only God can do. This is exactly What happened with Christianity, what started with Christ and his 12 disciples grew to a gathering of 120 in the upper room. It exponentially multiplied to thousands in the book of Acts and then to millions of people and billions of people over the course of history. What exactly do we want people to know everywhere? There are two things in particular that the Apostle Paul had reported that others had heard about them. And the first is that the Thessalonian believers had turned to God from idols. It's their testimony. The Apostle Paul elaborated on this in verse 9. These polytheists, having the belief in many gods, 
had become monotheist, belief in one God. And so what exactly have you turned from? What religions? Is it Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism? What spiritism? Is it magic and juju and ancestral worship? What unbelief? Is it from agnosticism or atheism? And when people come to faith in Jesus Christ, shouldn't the world hear about it? May our sound be one that tells of our faith in Christ, the transformation power of Jesus, that we are no longer who we used to be, the old self. We are a new creation. In addition, the Thessalonian believers had faith in the second coming of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul elaborated on this in verse 10. The Son of God is not finished his work. The one who was crucified, the one who was resurrected, the one who ascended will indeed come again. This must be your deep conviction. This is what makes us so audacious. The Thessalonians were eagerly awaiting Jesus' return. Because of his great mercy, we can identify with them because we're still waiting. And I think sometimes because of all that time that's elapsed, we give up hope. But be filled with hope today that the purpose of Jesus' second coming is to rescue believers from the coming wrath. The early churches believed Jesus was coming again in their lifetime. I want to challenge you to do the same, that Jesus may come in your lifetime. And even if it doesn't happen, we are at least living in a ready state of preparedness. For to remove the urgency from the second coming of Jesus is to remove the gospel's future orientation. See, the world should know that Christians anticipate the soon arrival of Jesus. May they know. May they know that we're waiting. May they know that we're excited. May they know that we're hopeful that he's coming soon. This is a key tenant of our faith. And people might think you're crazy, and that's okay. Let them think you're crazy. I want to ask you to ask yourself this question. What is known about you everywhere? What is known about you everywhere? Do people know how your life has changed? Do people know what you're waiting for and hoping for? May our sound be one that tells of our hope in Christ. See, this is not just the Thessalonians' testimony or my testimony or your testimony This is every believer's testimony. Our God has saved us from sin and our God will save us from wrath. This is the good news that we share. So as I conclude today, the final question I want to leave with you to ponder is, have you been telling the gospel message audaciously? If you are not imitating anyone, then there is a problem. If you're not modeling anything to anyone, then there is a problem. If you are not known anywhere, then we have a problem. And if we're going to live the audacious life God is calling us to live, we must stop being silent and we must choose to make a sound, a sound that reaches our city, a sound that reaches our province, a sound that touches our nation, a sound that travels even across the world. And so I pray that God would use you and raise you up to be audacious people in these days, that you would be a model, that you would be worthy of imitation, that your reputation would be known everywhere for being faithful Christ followers, and messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May they hear your testimony. May they know your hope. And may they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the way you've been speaking to our hearts. And Lord, I thank you for the call of God that is upon every person at Sycamore Community Church, that you are calling each of them to live the audacious life, even as they celebrate this milestone, as they look back on the previous eight years of what you've done, there is still more to come. In fact, the best is yet to come. 
And so, Father, I pray blessing over their church today. I pray that you'd empower them and that you'd mobilize them to be audacious believers in these days, oh God. Father, I pray, God, that they would have influence beyond measure, not only in Ibadan, but they'd also have it in their state. They'd also have it in their country. They'd have it through technology. They'd have it all over the world. Influence. Not to make their church great. Not so that they're famous. Not so they can move into a bigger building. Not so they can be on television or something else but God, so that you would be made famous throughout the earth. May their intentions be pure and their motivations be pure. But ultimately, God, as you use them, may you be glorified. May you be honored. And may the gospel of Jesus Christ go to places that we might not be able to go. But because the message is sent forward, the word never returns void. So, Father, I pray your blessing upon them today. Make them a blessing. Make them a blessing to the earth, oh God. Make them a blessing in their community and use them in great ways. And may we hear the testimonies even here in Canada of how you are using them, of how you are mobilizing them and they're making an impact, God, because they are your representatives, your ambassadors in this world. And so I thank you for this beautiful church. I pray your blessing on this eighth anniversary. There are many more milestones to celebrate to come. And so we look forward with great anticipation to hear and see what you will do. Be glorified through this church, I pray. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Father, our 
God, that's what we do today. We acknowledge that you've made a way for us to come. We acknowledge that your word has come and it has inspired us. And we pray today that we will follow hard after you. We pray today that we will follow hard after all of your leading. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Who's excited that God still speaks to us? Yes. I know he's particularly grateful for Pastor Chris for bringing the word of God to us this morning. Yes, I thought, I, I thought it was a powerful one this morning. And I wanted to give somebody a chance to respond. Somebody is in church this morning and you're not in the right place with God. And we don't like to close our services without giving somebody the opportunity to actually respond to Jesus. And if it's alright, it's alright with us to stand up to be on our feet because we want to honor this moment because we know that it all started for us one day when we made our life, when we gave our life to Jesus. Alright? And I, 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 I look back into my life. It's been 13 years right now of walking with Jesus. And it started with one day when I actually made that decision for Jesus. So wherever you are all over the world, if it's all right, would you just stand up with me? All eyes closed, all heads bowed. We're going to give somebody an honest moment to just make an opportunity to just to just respond to Jesus and I'm going to count to one to three now and I would just like for you to put your hand on your chest God sees you God has called you this morning and this is a time for you to actually make your decision for Jesus so one two three go put your hands on your chest God bless you God bless you God bless you all over this room if you are doing that right now all over wherever you are all over the world God sees you and God knows you and God is making a miracle start in your life together. So what we're going to do now is, this is a family and not a crowd. We're going to say a word of prayer together. And everybody will join in because we are identifying with you. Because we know that we also made this decision together. Can we pray together? Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today. Because you made a way for me to come to you. Through the death, the burial, the resurrection of your son Jesus. I make today the day that I give you my life. Forgive me of the past, Lord. Give me a whole new start. And I pray that one day I'll be with you together in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Pray. Amen. 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 Is somebody grateful that somebody gets to give his heart to Jesus today? I think it's a miracle. I think that God begins. It's not, as we used to say, it's not good to great. It's dead to life. All right, and this morning people have made a decision for Jesus, and I thought we'll, we'll, we'll clap about it and shout about it this morning. Yeah, great.